Good afternoon, and thank you for sticking it out to the end of the day. What I'm looking to do today is to present some of the economic drivers that are influencing both industries this year, and then to follow it up with a bit of a discussion on each fiber to draw attention to where Hebert sees the industries heading over the medium term. So let's turn to some of the common drivers. The demand side of the outlook is what looking what I'm calling quietly favorable for both fibers. The gradual strengthening of economic growth in global markets, particularly the EU and the US, are having a positive influence on demand for both fibers since they're major markets for imported clothing. And this should support prices over the medium term. At the same time, demand from China, which is the principal export market for both wool and cotton, remains strong. And despite the easing economic growth that we're assuming for that country, certainly it is the sustained strong retail sales growth that will support demand for Australian wool and cotton going forward. Also good news for, um, for supporting demand is the assumed appreciation of the Australian dollar, which makes Australian commodities more affordable on the world market and hence more competitive. On the supply side, certainly it's the dry seasonal conditions on the East Coast that have dominated the scene this year and have led to lower production of cotton, particularly in the dryland areas, and of wool because of the drought-induced turnoff of livestock. Now, interestingly, prices are not going in the same direction. Normally, if you have a decrease in supply and firm or strengthening demand, you would expect, expect prices to be on the rise. And certainly for wool, this is true, but for cotton, it is not. And that's because of what's going on in China and their stockpiling policy for cotton. And so this year, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to lead my presentation with a discussion about the, of all, on cotton and paying particularly att particular attention to that Chinese stockpiling piling policy in order to describe for you how it has such an influence on world markets. So let's start with some global indicators on the cotton market. Global production has been trending downward for a few years now, as the area planted to cotton has contracted as a result of more favorable prices for alternative crops like cassava, cotton, and soybeans. A gradual turnaround is expected, largely because of, of a recovery in major producing countries, namely the United States, that's had a couple of very bad years given the drought. At the same time, global consumption of cotton is trending up, and is expected to continue to do so given growth in consuming countries like India and Pakistan and Turkey, who process wool for textiles and clothing and then export it to apparel importing countries. Now, one country where consumption growth is actually not expected is China, the largest consumer of raw cotton. Consumption this year is expected to remain relatively flat at 7.8 million tons because of the high domestic cotton prices in that country. What's important here is that for the fourth year in a row, world production is higher than world consumption. And that means that for the fourth year in a row, global stocks are on the rise. Normally, if you would have such an increase in global stocks, you would expect significant downward pressure on prices. But in fact, what we're seeing is, a, is some downward movement in prices, but only to about 16% next year. Um, to come to about 75 cents a pound, which is still relatively high in historical terms. I want to touch now on the issue of stocks for a minute, just to describe for you why that price isn't forecast to go down any further. What I've got here is the stocks to use ratio. And that's a measure of the amount of carryover stock for any given commodity relative to how much of that good is going to be used in that year. This year, world stocks are expected to reach a record 86%. And what that means is there's a sufficient amount of cotton in storage globally to meet 86% of this year's cotton consumption. But the existing world measure is heavily weighted by China. Without China, world stocks are expected to be about 52%, which while slightly higher than last year, still falls within a pretty narrow band over the past eight or nine years. It's China's stock building policy, which has effectively removed much of the excess cotton from the world market. Over the past four years, China's stocks to use ratio has increased to about 155%. What that means is that China holds over a year and a half's worth of cotton for its own domestic use. 
That's in stocks alone, and it doesn't include how much China is going to produce this year, and it is the world's largest producer of cotton, or how much it's going to import this year, and it's also the world's largest importer of cotton. So why does China hold on to so much cotton? It goes something like this. Back in 2010-11, its stocks hit a record low, and it was at this point that China introduced several policies to support grower incomes and ensure a stable supply of cotton for its textile industry. So there's the state purchases of domestic cotton policy that offers a floor price to its domestic growers. And there are also some trade protection measures for raw cotton imports that ensure that the price of imported cotton is much higher than the world price. And China's raw imports of cotton are significant. As I said earlier, China's the world's largest importer of cotton. And over the past five years, its world import share it's, has averaged at 38%. And of course, there's been some variability in that, as you can see here. A few years ago, imports hit a record 5.3 million tons, and that's when it first introduced its stock building policy. And much of what it imported, it put directly into stocks. Now, since that time, imports have tapered off, but stocks have continued to rise. Also contributing to its stocks have been the state's purchases of its own domestically produced cotton, which you see here in the blue bar, at a procurement price that is higher than the world price. The green line shows how effective the policy has been at raising the national strategic reserve, which now means that China holds about 62% of the world's stocks. So what we're seeing in terms of our forecast for the world price isn't being influenced by this. It's being influenced by what is in that world stocks available outside of China, which given that it's falling within that narrow band, the downward pressure is actually quite minimal. If we included these stocks, if these stocks were available to the world market, to all cotton using countries, the impact on world price would be much lower. The stocks held by China are released by the government in a controlled way. They're sold to the mills through an auction process. And it was when this policy of releasing the stock slowly began that the gap between the world price and the price paid by the mills in China began to really increase. This widespread demonstrates just one of the factors that is constraining growth and consumption in China, that of increasing input costs. But the Chinese cotton industry is also facing additional increased costs in terms of the costs of labor, as well as stricter environmental regulations that are putting additional costs on businesses. Now, why this policy is important and why I'm going into it a bit uh, this year is because of the potential impact that it has on world prices and on import demand. The high level of stocks combined with stagnant consumption growth has negative implications for import growth from China. It's weakening, and that puts downward pressure on prices. Additionally, there's always the chance that China could increase the rate at which it releases its stocks to its mills. If it does that, that would put further downward pressure on import growth, and therefore that would put more downward pressure on prices. That would effectively be tantamount to a supply shock because there wouldn't be that import demand from China. Our forecasts don't assume any change in the Chinese policy. There's no way anybody could know what they're going to do. But I mention it now so that you understand how one market can potentially have such a strong influence on the world market. I'll just stop that for now and briefly turn our attention to things at home. Australian production has declined over the past couple of years, following a couple of really excellent years with good seasonal conditions. The fall has been the result of a lower area planted as the world price of cotton has come down and as the price of sorghum has been relatively favorable. This trend is expected to continue for a few more years, until about the end of the projection period we, when we expect some turnaround given uh, some increase in, in demand from the global market. Still, it should be noted that production remains above a 15-year average, so it's still quite good. Now, as for next year, we do recognize that forecasting is quite a difficult exercise because at the moment we're in the throes of a drought and we have no way of knowing what the situation is going to be come, come spring. Uh, we assume average, favor average seasonal conditions, which means the chance of achieving median rainfall is equal. 
Certainly since planting doesn't start until September, should seasonal conditions improve, soil moisture improves, the situation will be different than what one might suppose now if the season doesn't break. In terms of exports, they'll follow the production trend, although always one year in delay, given that uh, harvest happens close to the end of the financial year and most of what, what we export happens in the new financial year. Unlike world prices that are expected to come down somewhat over the next couple of years, the returns to Australian cotton growers will be increasing. And that's because they'll be assisted by the lower Australian dollar, as well as by strengthening demand towards the end of the forecast period. Turning our attention now to wool, dry conditions in the east this year have led to a significant increase in sheep and land ter lamb turnoff, as we've seen in previous drought years. This year, though, it's not just been weathers and lambs that we've turned off, but also older breeding ewes particularly crossbred ewes. At the end of this year, the size of the national flock is expected to be about 2.4 million head lower, ending the year at 71.8 million head. Assuming more average seasonal conditions, flock rebuilding is expected over the outlook period, but at a modest rate, as the industry balances its ability to increase each strata of the flock, while continuing to meet the strong export demand for sheep meat, particularly by the Middle East and by China. It's only by the end of the medium term that Hebert's forecast the flock to returning to where it was last year. I'll just turn now to wool production. Shorn wool production is expected to fall 4% this year to 345,000 tonnes because of fewer sheep shorn and lower fleece weights given the poor pasture conditions in the eastern states. Over the medium term, short wool, shorn wool production is expected to increase gradually in line with the rate of flock expansion, and no real forecast weakening of the demand for wool is expected. As for prices, last December the eastern market indicator hit an eight-month high. Producers took advantage of the price rise to liquidate some stocks. Now with those stocks sold and the national flock much smaller than it was last year, it's assumed that the supply of shorn wool, be, will, shorn wool will be tight for the next couple of years, and that should support prices. Also lending a hand to the price received by Australian exporters is the depreciating dollar. As you can see here, since the Australian dollar started falling, the EMI in Australian dollars has been higher than that in US dollars. And that gap has been widening since December when that exchange rate fell to below 90 cents. In terms of our exports of wool, like cotton, China is our most important destination for our exports, taking about three quarters of what we produce. Demand for wool and apparel from China's own domestic retail sector is expected to support demand for Australian raw wool going forward, since China consumes around half of its production of finished wool textiles and apparel. And over the medium term, exports are expected to trend up moderately, in line with our production. It is also possible looking forward that some apparel production in China will be re relocated gradually to countries with lower labor costs, like Vietnam where the capacity and production of textiles and garments is growing. And that was reflected in its 19% increase in exports last year. What impact that might have on our exports of raw wool and where they're destined is so far unknown, but that's certainly a space that we continue to watch. So just to summarize some of my key messages from this presentation, for cotton, the world consumption of raw cotton is assumed to increase over the medium term, given the assumed income growth in raw cotton consuming countries like India, Pakistan, and Turkey, and in economic growth in the US and EU. Demand from China will remain a significant factor for Australia's cotton industry, although demand from that country will be relatively flat. And in Australia, production is expected to taper off given the forecast reduction in area planted to cotton. Grower returns are expected to rise with strengthening consumption and a lower Australian dollar. For wool, we expect stronger demand by the US and the EU, given their forecast of economic growth, and Australian wool production is expected to increase modestly over the medium term, given strengthening sheep meat prices, which will encourage flock expansion. Wool prices are forecast to strengthen this year and to rise modestly over the medium term, assisted by the lower Australian dollar and certainly by the tight supply. Thank you very much.